To get things started, however, um, it's great, my great pleasure to introduce our first presenter for this afternoon or evening, uh, Awais Hussein, uh, who's a student of linguistics at the University of York. Uh, Awais is currently researching the Mirpur region of Jammu and Kashmir in collaboration with other scholars and researchers, including Dr. Sanali Gupta of the Himalayan Institute of Cultural and Heritage Studies. Awais is an avid researcher of family history. Um, he's the founder of the Mirpur and Dajjal Heritage Society, and he's extensively researched the genealogies of people in the Mirpur region, while also collaborating with the Australian Indian Historical Society. His chapter on Mirpur's history was recently published in the collection Society and Politics of Jammu and Kashmir, which was edited by Dr. Serena Hussain and published by Palgrave um, just this past year. Um, and the research that appears in that chapter is, I think, closely linked with the subject of Hawais' talk today, Reviving Mirpur's Heritage. Uh, if we turn the floor over to you, Hawais, and welcome. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll just share my presentation now. I hope that you can all see that. Very yeah. Good. yeah. So uh, firstly, I want to thank everyone involved for setting up this opportunity to share these different aspects of research uh, on me on uh, digital heritage. And uh, my presentation is titled Reviving Mirpur's Heritage. And I'll just introduce what each part of that means. So um, in terms of Mirpur, uh, Mirpur is a district of present-day Azad, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which is administered by Pakistan, but prior to partition, it was part of India, and um, it was formerly part of the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir. And its location is transitional between the Patwar region of the Punjab and uh, the Par region, which is um, present-day Jammu, Poonch, that area. So, And it's nearby to... Um, Rawalpindi, Islamabad, which is the capital of Pakistan as well. And it surrounds where the river Poonch meets the river Jhelum. And Mirpur can refer to a few different places, so I'll just um, introduce what they are. So there's the old city Mirpur, and this was destroyed due to the uh, construction of Mangla Dam, which I'll elaborate more on later on. And it also refers to the new city, because when the old city was destroyed, the new Mirpur city was developed in place of that. And then it also refers to the district, the wider district of Mirpur. And the Mirpur heritage that I'm referring to refers to the, the cultural sphere, the whole Mirpur region. Um, yes, yeah, so in 2019, we set up a Facebook group to present our heritage and establish a platform where the wider community from Mirpur could access multimedia about the area and find out more about their origins and their heritage, like they were able to ask questions, have discussions, make posts, share personal stories and so on about the region and about their history and cultural heritage. And this group has now grown to around 3000 members and now we're actually in the process of establishing a much better way to preserve and demonstrate Mirpur's heritage in the form of a website, in the form of a kind of digital heritage archive. Yeah, so who we are, uh, people from Mirpur are an established diaspora in Britain and there's approximately 600,000 people from in, in Britain from Mirpur, from the Mirpur region. And it's um, estimated to be the second most common mother tongue in Britain. Uh, the, the, language sp uh, the language spoken in Mirpur is Mirpur Pari and that's estimated to be the second most common language in Britain, uh, mother tongue after English. And um, our project is a communal effort bringing together many different academics, notably there's Dr. Sonali Gupta who we're working on this project with to research our roots and digitally represent and record the Mirpur region's heritage. And this project aims to build a kind of platform, a digital heritage database website um, to demonstrate the different kinds of research that we've been looking into in terms of previous things that we've already gathered and future projects that we're working on and this um to elaborate that there's different kinds of aspects of our region that we'd like to delve more into in terms of memory in terms of genealogy in terms of the language and the culture and in doing so we want to record memories of elders from the region 
particularly early memories of partition and the pre-dam geography, because the dam destroyed much of Mirpur. So we'd like to revive that aspect of it, revive the memories and uh, record them for future and for future generations to benefit from. And uh, early Mirpur, the, the early history of Mirpur, not that much is known about early Mirpur, but legend has it that there's a link to, uh, for example, the Battle of Hydaspes where Alexander the Great fought against King Porus. So that's one uh, mythological link that the plain of Hydaspes where that battle took place could link to the Mirpur region. And the main bulk of settlement into the region, into the Mirpur region, um, migration to the region took place probably within the past 300 to 400 years. And although, um, in spite of that, though, there is evidence that there were much more ancient settlements there. So, for example, there's uh, these photographs here demonstrate the um, uh, rock carvings, uh, rock edicts, which were found in a place called Chitturpuri, which is near Mirpur. And these give evidence that there was a Stone Age settlement there. And you can see that there's these uh, rock carvings of some kind of animals and the and there's some kind of script there as well. And moving on, there are two main events in the past century, in the past hundred years, which forever changed Mirpur. And the first of these would probably be the would be the partition of 1947, which cataclysmically changed the whole subcontinent in that it divided India into Pakistan and modern day India. And there was mass migration from both sides of India and uh, so from India to, to the newly developed Pakistan and from Pakistan to India. So people from Mirpur migrated to India and people migrated from Mirpur to India as well. And obviously, well, there was violence experienced everywhere and it was really, um, it was a really atrocious time for everybody. And it divided the community and disrupted Mirpur's affinity with the wider Jammu and Kashmir area in that it was divided, in that people were migrating from it and they no longer had access to their original, um, their original home place where they were born. And one aspect that we're exploring is that artifacts and objects hold social memory and these memories live on in objects. And the image here is of pebbles from Mirpur which were taken during partition. So there's um, these pebbles belonged to Dr. Jagdev Mitter Gupta, who was um, who was a doctor from Mirpur. He was born in Old Mirpur in a place called Murdagali, and during partition, he fled. He, he and his family fled Mirpur, and he took with him these pebbles, and he kept these by his bedside until the very end. And we're very interested in this kind of transfer of memory through digital tools through. Um, preserving these different kinds of artifacts that that exist the second kind of uh, the second cataclysmic event in the past century would probably be the construction of mangla dam and this was a hydroelectric dam which was built in the 1960s it was built in mangla which is a village near mirpur and it and that's why it's called mangla dam and that destroyed hundreds of villages, ancestral homes, mosques, temples, graveyards, the old architecture, because it flooded the whole region and it uh, submerged more than 300 surrounding villages and displaced more than 100,000 people. And um, so our main project is reviving Mirpur and this project aims to digitally restore the areas of Mirpur which were submerged and destroyed by Mangla Dam, as well as recording early memories of what the geography was like, of what the culture was like, of the heritage in the region. And this, this project involves collating existing resources such as maps, photography, drone and satellite footage of the region um, as the water recedes each year so we can see what the landscape was like. And uh, as well as that, there'll also be oral history research being uh, being researched, for example, uh, recording elders who remember the, the landscape and preserving their memories. And overall, we'll use both of these resources, so the existing resources and the, the research that we'll conduct to transform all of these different um, 
kinds of aspects into an interactive map using some kind of 3D drawing software so that we can uh, gain a digital representation of what Mirpur used to be like before the dam destroyed it all. And so now these are just a few images of what present day uh, Mirpur looks like. So um, areas of Mirpur that were submerged uh, this is the Raghunath temple complex, and you can see how the waters eroded the, the, the buildings there. And this is uh, the local old well at the bazaar, at the marketplace near Old Mirpur. And this is the Shiv temple, which was a temple in, in Old Mirpur as well. And this is a closer, um, a closer image of the Shiv temple. And it's, it's very um, poignant for a lot of people to see in that Dr. Jagdev Mitra Gupta remembered this, this, um, this building vividly, even though he hadn't seen it in perhaps more than 50, 60 years, he remembered vividly uh, going there in his childhood. And this is the uh, Kalarwari Masjid, which is near Do Old Didyal, and you can see how the you can see how the waters damaged the, the, the architecture and the graves there. And so another aspect that we're researching is genealogy and there are many different kinds of ways that we can preserve the genealogy of the, reg of the region, of the Mipa region. So that's in terms of oral history as well, in terms of asking elders, in terms of their ancestors and their origins. And there's also a family known as the Ra, whose hereditary profession it was to go village to village and record genealogy, kind of like a census. And similar to how there are genealogy records in Haridwar, it's a similar kind of process. And there's also land records which document land disputes, which can also give an insight into genealogy and family history. And then another aspect that we're exploring is culture and customs in general. So that can include traditional songs, local dishes and foods, recipes for those, um, how houses were made, how different kinds of tools were made, and weaving, sewing designs, farming and agricultural customs, how people used to grow crops, herbal, her herbal remedies and so on. Those are the different kinds of aspects of culture that we'll explore. And this is a photograph of a cut, which is like a bedstead. And the wooden legs of this were made by my great great grandfather. So these are the kinds of artifacts that we'll be looking into, to um, to which dis which demonstrate social memory in a kind of physical form. And so photographs of these and digital uh, memories of these can be used to preserve the memory and overall give a a better representation of what life used to be like. And yeah, I think that's the, th thank you for listening. And I'll pass it on to the host to, for questions. Sure, thank you very much for that. And um, excellent presentation. I'm sorry that we can't give you a round of applause properly, but I'm sure um, everyone joins me in thanking you for a very fascinating presentation of your work. A few questions that have come through in the chat during your presentation, um, the first of which came from Debs, um, and her question was, uh, are the two events that displaced, oh, beg your pardon, sorry, the applause coming through has um, uh, lost track of the question. Thank you for your patience. Um, the question is, are the two events that displaced people from Mirpur, partition and the construction of the Mangla Dam, linked in people's memory of the region? That's an interesting question. I think the the so the construction of Mangla Dam was a result of the partition in that the the Indus uh, Basin Treaty, which um, the the water rights between India and Pakistan, that was one of the reasons which led to Mangla Dam being constructed. So there is a kind of political link between between the dispersal during partition and the the migration from uh, from the region due to Mangladam. So there is a kind of political link there. And in terms of linking, in terms of uh, people's memories, there's given a mass migration from the region twice in one century is kind of a big movement. So you can visualize it as, a, as being kind of a, it's a similar kind of social catastrophe that happened in both occurrences. So there's that link as well. Yeah. Terrific. Um... 
Thank you very much. And a, a second question uh, coming from Ben in the chat. Um, with the oral history that you record and you, you're recording, um, how will you make sure that that will be accessible and usable um, by the diaspora? Um, so, so in terms of, I guess, the steps that you're taking uh, to make this accessible, um, how are you thinking through that need to make this kind of material more widely accessible and the steps that need to be taken to achieve that goal? Yeah, so we're in the process of setting up a kind of website which will be a digital heritage platform and on there there'll be a lot of different videos and audio recordings which can be accessed by people from the region who are interested in exploring those in more detail and as well as that these will probably be transcribed, translated so that they can reach a wider audience so the the database that we're making will hopefully incorporate all of these different things that we're doing so that's how they'll be accessible for for people who are interested to access them you know thank you very much and it, it occurs to me that sort of the, at the moment the chat i'm just allowing it to ventriloquize me um so perhaps instead, i mean i'm very happy to read people's questions from the chat if you'd like me to do so but it might animate the discussion a little bit if i could invite um people asking the questions themselves to speak. Catherine, would you be willing to do so to your question about organization and storage? Yes, absolutely. Um, I may have actually missed this because I had to pop out in the middle. So I, apologies if I'm asking something that you already answered. Um, but how are you organizing all of this information that you're gathering? And obviously it's quite diverse. So you, you just mentioned a database then, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you're organizing this and making sure it's maintained and again for the future like Ben was asking. Yeah that's a, that's a very interesting question so in terms of how we're organizing it all there's a lot of different researchers who are involved so and each of these different researchers have their own kind of domains so there's linguists who are involved and there's social geographers who are involved and each of these um, individuals have their own kind of domains of which area of Mirpur or which aspect of the heritage they're looking into. So, and before this project began, we were all kind of doing our own thing. So this project aims to kind of um, make sure that everybody's on one page and we have a platform with, where we can all um, demonstrate our own research on the region to the wider community so that each person can have a kind of domain in the website and then they can uh, demonstrate their um, aspect of research to the wider community, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Well, excellent. Um, and then uh, Farah, um, would you mind asking your question? Or may I invite you to do so? Yes, of course. Thank you so much, OS, for your lovely talk. And the images are really interesting. So I wanted to know in the, in this particular project, will you be looking at the Bahari Patwari language in terms of the linguistic side of it, since you are a linguistic student as well? Yeah, so we will be because one of the um in, in the website, one of the uh, domains, one of the portals will be focused on the language on the Mirpur Pari language because it is an understudied language. So we'll be looking into the linguistics of that in terms of um, the grammar and also maybe um, a kind of maybe we'll start some kind of videos or resources to help people learn the language as well as there's not any learning resources either so that's one of the things that we'll be um, incorporating into this project Bahari Batwari learning facilities and um, things in general to do with the language as well so such as poetry and literature short stories that kind of thing we'll incorporate into the project too. Great, thank you, Wes. Thank you. And thank you all for such great questions, but thank you for such um, splendid answers. Um, are there any further questions at this point? Because I think it might be ideal in some way to move on to the next presentation. We can possibly think collectively as we go through, but I see that someone's, um, thank you, Deb. Charlotte, I'm sorry if I overlooked your question in the chat. Um, you know, I'm overlooking a raised hand, I beg your pardon, but may I invite you to pose your question, Charlotte? Thank you. No, that's fine. Don't worry. I was just going to ask about um, how the locals look at the dam, whether it's um, overly positive or negative because of the displacement, because obviously it's providing power and water. So whether it's a bit of a mix on how people view it. Yeah, I think that that's another interesting question. I think 
the people of Mirpur do view it as negative, uh, as overly negative because of the fact that it destroyed so much cultural heritage and it destroyed the, the region, the, their, the place where their ancestors used to live and they were forcefully kind of um, told to move there and they were promised a lot of different things from the government while it was made that they'd have really good um, electricity facilities and a lot of promises were made that weren't kept by the government as well. So these are some um, of the aspects which mean that even though the dam was made, the people of Mipur haven't really as benefited from it as the people of, say, main Pakistan have. So that's, um, I think the answer to that would probably be that it was, um, that is perceived as more overly negative than, than positive, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. I was also going to ask, because um, mostly dams don't last that long, and if it was built in the 60s, um, is it kind of structurally dangerous or does it need repairs? Um, I think it, so. It, there is an appraisal which, which happens, but I think it's controlled. So, for example, if, if an area is affected more, then that means that um, the government um, informs the people and they're told to move. So there is um, there is safety uh, procedures that are carried out there. If that, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and I hope I haven't passed over anyone else. I don't see any other raised hands. But if I'm missing you, just please feel free to shout out in the chat. I'll see you there. Without further ado then, and uh, thank you very much, Shafai. So we maybe can return to further questions and discussion, picking up on some themes that hopefully will emerge in a complementary fashion over our next presentations. But our second presentation this afternoon um, is, a, is a double act uh, featuring Dr. Anki Mukherjee and Mr. Shubham Gaswami. Uh, Dr. Mukherjee is an assistant professor in the Amity School of Communication at Amity University in Uttar Pradesh. She was awarded her PhD in film studies in 2017 from the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad, for her pioneering thesis, Contemporary Latin American Cinema, Locating the Transition from the National to the Transnational. Um, and I say pioneering because this work is one of the first uh, and very few extensive studies on Latin American cinema to come out of Indian academia. Um, Dr. Mukherjee has over 10 years of experience in research and teaching since uh, her postgraduate studies. Um, and her chapter on new Latin American cinema will be published very soon in a forthcoming anthology entitled Film Studies and Introduction, uh, being published by Worldview Publishers in Delhi and uh, Kolkata. Her research areas um, are fairly extensive, spanning as they do across Latin American cinema, third cinema, transnational cinema theory, visual culture, Eurocentrism and non-Western cinema, as well as cultural memory studies, um, which is actually integral to the work that she's presenting today alongside uh, Shubham Gaswami, who's an MA student in Persian language and literature in the School of Language, Literature and Cultural Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Um, Subsam's research interests are primarily focused on Persian poets, manuscripts of medieval India, and also Persian poetry in the digital age. And he's recently presented a paper at the international conference uh, conducted by the Comparative Literature Association of India entitled An Introductory Exploration into the Presence of Persian Poetry on Instagram. But today he and um, Anki will be taking up a somewhat different topic in their presentation um, in design and dissemination, posters of students resistance in India. Um, welcome both of you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Oh, I beg your pardon, Dr. Mukherjee, uh, I think you're on mute. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. OK, thank you so much. OK, good evening and good afternoon to one and all present here. Me and Shubham are greatly honored and pleased to be able to share this prestigious platform with you all today in the fourth session of UK India Education and Research Initiatives Digital Heritage Workshop hosted by Lancaster University titled as Digital Media Archives. We are going to present our work in design and dissemination Posters of Students' Resistance in India. This research is at its initial stage 
Thus, it is not exhaustive in its nature and hopes to seek several opinions, observations, and also suggestions for alternative approach and methods that can be applied in order to conduct a study like this. This paper attempts to locate the role by the posters made and circulated by the students' organizations. I am extremely sorry, I just need to share my screen. Just one minute for the distraction. This format is fine. OK, thank you. Fine. So this paper attempts to locate both the locate the role played by the posters made and circulated by the students organization as a mouthpiece of contemporary students resistance movement during the time of pandemic. Just before the lockdown started in India on 22nd of March 2020, India was witnessing series of protests all over the country regarding the new law CAA and also Delhi riots after the Ayodhya verdict in November 2019. Students and activists were main protesters and universities like Jamia Millia Islamia Jalal Nehru University became the center for the resistance movement in India. As soon as the pandemic hit, the protest was mellowed down a little bit for sure. However, the students kept the fervor of protest through the poster that became one of the major voices of the students' movement. This paper observes that a recent uh, trend is visible where students are empowering themselves by raising their voice against the draconian laws by the government through social media, which opens up one and only platform for them to engage in a dialogue. This poster aims to raise awareness, assert democratic rights of the citizens as well as the marginalized communities, sustain resistance, mobilizing collective conscience to demand justice, raising an alternative voice against the pro-government narratives. Posters in general serves the following functions. We are going to analyze our posters based on the following observations. These are the following observations that based on this we are going to analyze our posters which we are going to screen in a while. Posters endure as one of the most permanent and solid forms of the visual communication and thus probably this becoming one of the most iconic you know mouthpiece of the students protest movements. Posters are also capable of shaping physical and or virtual spaces while reflecting and altering human behavior. Posters can establish zones of behavioral expectations. Posters can provide unified voice to a large number of people. In this particular case, we will see that the students' organizations are not only encoding these messages in this particular posters, but also they are circulating and they are kind of making this as their voice of their own through this particular posters. Posters can be easily accessible and disseminated. Posters can assert ownership of space itself. So here we are taking the position of an observer and trying to explain the entire process through which these posters are encoded and also being circulated and disseminated in order to achieve its purpose and goals. However, in this paper, I or would or I would or we would also like to pose the question to the audience as well as the time to come in the future times to come if these endeavors by the students association can be at all called an archive as digital archives are organized in nature to be able to call itself an ar archive for the first part. Whereas social media is too disorganized in its all approach as archiving something as serious as history. Now I will quickly go to my posters, although I'm just starting with some posters on the screen for the audience to engage with the discussion. And I'll come to this different classification of posters in a while. Through this post, this, through the dissemination of these posters via social media pages and accounts, students are able to carve out a space for themselves to engage the people, engage with the people of country in a dialogue. This dialogue enables the process of 
creating awareness towards the history of the struggle of the oppressed through a process of reminiscence or chalking out the history through memory. By situating the contemporary struggle against the fascist force in the historical context, these students association movements are carving these posters where they argue this struggle is not recent phenomena. Rather, it's, it is historical in its nature. Thus, they aim to raise awareness against this oppression and demand people to stand with them in solidarity. Here, they overtly depend on poster, which is becoming the main voice or their mouthpiece in this pandemic time. Through attractive and bold use of colors such as red, white, black and yellow, they are presenting their messages with clarity. We see few common tendencies here. Usually, students are making these posters through application which makes the communication process fast and cheap. They are not trained designers, yet they project an instinctive sense of design aesthetics while encoding the message. The use of red as well as in occasion black has its influence from the political posters in the past across the world. Red signifies the revolution, whereas black often signifies resistance all these posters have the dominance of the color red or in certain cases black in the background. Whereas the fonts are usually sans serif while the color that is used is yellow or white as the, these two colors are brightest colors in point. And we can also notice here the tendency to give importance to the message or the text rather than the design principles. Thus, for the purpose of legibility, they are also resorting to these fonts and colors. All the posters also are using a direct address to communicate with the audience. Now, in this for our purpose, we are categorizing or classifying these posters in three categories, posters of remembrance, posters of camping, and posters of awareness. Posters of remembrance are basically those posters which are trying to chart the history through mem commemorating any con particular special event or particular special date, anniversary or birth anniversary or death anniversary or an anniversary of important event. They are trying to contextualize the contemporary movement and keep on asserting that this struggle is not a recent one, but this is a continuous struggle. Also, this particular posters of remembrance has an importance or emphasis to the individual centric narrative where we see these individuals as those people they are often idolizing. And these people are Baba Sahib Ambedkar, Fulan Devi, Bhagat Singh, Periyar, Savitrivai Phule, etc. These faces are also, these particular narratives of remembrance posters are also charting particularly marginal faces and their narratives. This particular uh, posters, remembrance posters are also quite often using their, you know, direct messages and direct address in carving this particular messages. And also in this particular poster, especially the poster in the left, the struggle for Jal Jungle Zameen is not a crime. If I want to translate Jal Jungle Zameen, it means water, forest, and land. It is not a crime. Fighting for water, forest, and land is not a crime. And they are kind of asserting the struggle of the marginal people in order to struggle for holding on to their lands. And they are also kind of using a composition of centrality. They are centrally positing this human figure or the personalities they are projecting and through with through them they are communicating and try to raise an awareness among the mass the next category is posters of campaigns this posters of 
Champions are particularly used for uh, when they are designing a particular uh, event in order to call for a protest movement. All these campaigns are one or other protest incidents and events which is kind of brought into this particular poster form. These campaigns, particularly most uh, unlike any other categories, mostly concentrate on the matter in message and they're coming commenting not only just why this particular event has been organized, but also when, where and who all are participating. The purpose of this campaign posters are often very evident in this particular posters. How we and connect to this purpose with the particular another idea that they are had an overemphasis with the words that some way connote to the ideas of freedom or solidarity. And definitely they are using kind of state direct messages. Next is this kind of awareness posters are also one of the posters that are kind of becoming one of the most commonly coming out of posters as they are kind of addressing the events they are going to conduct and through which they are kind of gen, you know gaining the momentum of the protest. Last category of our kind is that awareness posters or posters of awareness. This posters of awareness, what is written in the background that is Azadi is what means freedom. The main subject of this particular awareness are particularly majorly two in nature. One is raising awareness for release of the political prisoners, which kind of had a immense number of political prisoners in the past two years. From 2019 onwards, we see there is a huge number of political prisoners who are imprisoned and they are kind of present without proper chart sheet and proper clarification from the authority that why at all they are imprisoned. Second, another point they are raising awareness is the solidarity, kind of trying to gain solidarity for the ongoing protest of various kinds, such as Hathras rape case and farmers protest. They are not only gaining solidarity, but also spreading awareness among why and on this which context this particular protest are generating. This last but not the least, this awareness posters are also using the iconic symbols that are popular iconic symbols and images of resistance such as hands, fist, sickle, hammer, as well as representing the state as a monstrous being. For example, the one on our right, which kind of exemplifies that the state here is presented into a monstrous being, which is kind of oppressing its citizens and most importantly, targeting the student community for raising the voice. Last but not the least, this awareness programs also use a strong condemning language or statements in order to criticize the government. Now I would uh, ask Shubham to uh, you know, draw attention to its circulation and reception mode. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, I'm afraid I can't, cannot switch on the video because I don't want to risk my presentation with the unstable connection. So, I'll be, uh, so basically coming from a campus, coming from a campus which is very politically vibrant and in the forefront of the student resistance in India, I'd like to cover the circulation and who are the receivers and examine how, examining how there's a difference between the chunks of the organization and their posters. So uh, circulation here is shown basically through the social media because as the paper intends to map the situation after pandemic, primarily focusing after lockdown. Uh, hence, the physical modes of circulations became, uh, they tend to become very dis distant and the shift was captured by the social media, uh, mainly, the, mainly the social media platforms like uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, majorly the, these applications, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, hence, the posters became a primary career of uh, the voices of student resistance and uh, this enacted through the virtual media spaces. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Here we see our same poster, which is shared by our organization ISA, 
uh, that was uploaded on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, so basically, we can see. Uh, I'm sorry, it's very short, but you can see there. Uh, it's very tiny. There are 92 likes on the Facebook ones. There are 54 likes on the Twitter one, and there are 77 likes on the uh, Instagram ones. So to mark or choose amongst the three, or on which application is preferred more can't be really determined as the difference in the viewership is uh, more or less the same. Like the difference between this 95, 65, 77 is very less. Next slide, please. Coming to who are the receive. This is the, sorry, this is the another example of the same. Like uh, you can see there are 64 likes on the Facebook ones. There are 95 likes on the Twitter ones. Yeah. So uh, coming to who are the recipients and how the reception acts. So it is divided into primary, secondary, and tertiary. So primary, in the primary ones, uh, it's basically the organizational editors and the poster makers and who are the the uh, the the, uh, the people from the organization who makes and circulates and who are responsible for circulating the things. So. Uh, they are the ones, then comes the organizational members, uh, then the subscribers and followers. These are the primary recipients. Secondary recipients, we have uh, the student community, the activist, the student community and activists, preferably from the uh, university spaces and the academical, academia spaces. Then we come to the sympathizers. Tertiary recipients are, the, are those who are as what the feature follows on the social media, what we known as, but which is known as the friends of friends, as the poster which I share is uh, is seen by and the viewership is extended by my friends list, and thus it's an unending process of circulating. So in ten, resulting in this, the uh, receivers during tending, when the posts a particular post which is trending, and the receivers come to come across, happen to come across the posters. Then we have the media houses as uh, they use, they uh, uh, they borrow the posters, they use the posters while reporting uh, the ongoing protest or any protest that happen to have uh, come across uh, their interest for their articles and news. So uh, when we start observing, uh, we find the distinction of privilege and the un underprivileged has uh, more to do uh, with the uh, with the ideal ideological positioning uh, rather than design as the posters uh, uh, that come from ambedkarite organizations so there's a say, there's a difference between ambedkar as uh, bhimrao ambedkar the father of indian constitution the followers and the organizational members who who tend to follow that ideology is known as ambedkarite and the rest are right and the left right liberals left liberals so uh, as the posters that come from the Ambedkarite organization has more assertion of color, such as blue, icons such as Ambedkar, Pule, Periyar, and so on. Uh, they are very polemical in nature and uh, tend to confront uh, the state, the uh, the government, through the through critiquing the Brahminical, the upper caste edifice of the country. Whereas the posters from the left liberal organization have more assertion on the content, they have more jargons and connection with the contemporaries made with the historical struggles. Uh, uh, in this observation, we can I'm see... So in, sorry to interrupt, but um, probably need to wrap it up within the next minute, if that's possible. Just I'm, 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 exactly, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, so it's basically in the university spaces, there is a lap overlap between the design, background design, and people from... There is a collection and the, which becomes stagnant and they use such jargons and slogans like Jai Bheem, Lal Salam, the Red Salute and Inklab Zindabad, Long Live Revolution and so on. Uh, uses of folk art and Western designs are usually common for most of the organizations. So thank you. I I, I hope I have done justice in this thing. Uh, Dr. Mukherjee, if you like to conclude. I would like to open the session for the discussion. I think we will have anything to say we can say it in the question answer session shall i answer i'm it? sorry we have taken much time yeah. 
Oh, that's perfectly fine. We still have nine minutes for questions before we can turn over a new leaf. But thank you both very much. And yes, for certainly, I'm very happy to open the questions. And we've had a few come through in the chat. Um, I beg you for just, sort of scr just scrolling back. So, um, may I invite um, the first question, actually, um, from Priyati? Uh, would you mind uh, posing your question? May I invite you to do so? Yeah. Hi. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate you for the presentation. I think it was really interesting. And I mean, I've seen a lot of these posters because I'm from Kolkata myself. So I um, and it was great to hear about them in such detail in the presentation. So I was just thinking, you know, like posters have always been a very powerful tool, of course, historically for protest. Um, but when they're put on social media platforms where you already have such a huge uh, variety of uh, visual media content. So um, do you think like that makes it harder or it makes it more challenging for someone creating a political poster um, uh, if they're making one for social media where there's already so much competition from all other kinds of visual media? I think the competition, if you at all say, is not on the level of composing the posters or encoding the messages or creating or circulating in the social media. I think that is the easier part of the posters being circulated or encoded and you know disseminated through the social media. My question, which I also asked in this particular presentation, however, briefly, maybe that mm -hmm. my question is if this is going to be considered as an archive in its own nature, because social media is also fickle in its appearance and, you know, it is very disorganized in its approach as well. So my question is archive is something that you can access in posterity, right, for, a, mm -hmm. you know, a indefinite time to come. But if this posters which are circulating, which is also sometimes archiving very important messages, but still my question was also that if it is easier to archive this and if it is 20 years later or 30 years later, if somebody is want to make a dissertation or research on this, will they have an access to these posters which are massively circulated in social media? And as you said that you have seen some of them as well. Oh, really good points, actually. And I think it picks up on an issue that I think Debs wants to raise in the question as well. But, but just to work in order, Rihanna, you had the question of the use of language, which is obviously a very significant feature of the posters that were shown. Yeah, so obviously English is uh, an official language in India. Um, but I was thinking that because you were talking about how the font and the colours, they're, they're a deliberate choice by the poster makers. And I was wondering, what is the reason behind English? Like why is that? Because obviously you do have some that are, are two languages, but what? why is English the kind of front and centre to some of them? Yeah. The main one of the main reason why they're using English is that it is mainly coming from the university circuit. And that is why in the last point, Shubham tried to raise the particular question that if there is a significant difference into the posters that are encoded or designed by the privileged community of the society, students community, as well as the underprivileged student community. But as this particular space where this protest and the need for posters is generating is this universities, which is elite spaces at the same time, which is constructing the elite acti academia. Yes, we are raising our voice for the under uh, developed uh, you know, communities are the underprivileged communities for the marginal communities, yet our entire structure of speaking, discussing, dialoguing is coming from the English academia space because they are students primarily and majority of the students are PhD or MPhil students or master students. So they are engaging in their research background. They are many of them researching on these areas that they are also raising their voices against. So they are using a language English. First of all, this is one particular reason in my opinion. Second reason is that in India, there is multicultural space that every state speaks different language and every different language has several different dialects and accents throughout the state. So, for example, my mother tongue Bengali has been different dialects and pronunciation and accents throughout West Bengal as well as Bangladesh, which was before partition part of Bengal instead. 
so this particular considerations english becoming one of the language that is understood by all the students community which is kind of connecting the entire student community together although they are using several vernacular language posters as well which i didn't include here apart from few which has some hindi or some english along with english for the audience better understanding they are using vernacular but they are also parallel using a lot of english language posters as well thank you that was excellent answer funded <laughs> <laughs> and does um, can i invite you to pose your question yeah, thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed Um I was uh, a former student at JNU and have extremely fond memories of the poster arts all over the campus. And I was I mean, I've always loved the idea of there being a systematic attempt to archive those images, which are just fantastic. But they were always, by their very nature, ephemeral. You know, they would obviously weather, they would fade, they would be replaced. And I was wondering what the relationships or how the move to digital media for the circulation of those images has changed both that sense of renewal within a specific community. Because certainly at JNU, the po I mean, JNU, as you know, is, a, is quite a private space and quite an exclusive one. It was very much about the community as a fairly closed one. So that, I suppose, was the first part of my question, but also how the move to online has 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 happened at the same time as quite aggressive repression of the kind of politics that emerged from universities like JNU and Jamia. So I know the administration at JNU attempted to kind of restrict the ability of students to put up posters. There was the attempt to erase the political art done on the ring road outside Jamia. Um, so has, has the digitization of that political art actually allowed it to sort of spread in new ways and, and, and to create a sort of um, a new mediation of meaning, which is far less closed than it used to be as campus art. I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Can I? Yeah. OK. Yes, please. Go on, please go ahead with the question. I'll 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 try once. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, there was so, three questions. Uh, yeah, so. No, no, it's OK. It's OK. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, the reason why the digitization has led to the uh, as your questions as your question posed like uh, how it's coming over how it's taking over so basically first of all uh, there's an abundance of poster that will uh, that uh, happen to come available over time uh, on social media after the lockdown as we know uh, that uh, the physical avenues and the poster avenues as you were mentioning that wall posters in jnu and all so these uh, Th these are still dominant. These are these are still not. Uh, these are still not come back to original and how they have uh, been during the lockdown. So uh, secondly, it's uh, in the nature of the contents that are shown on the social media platforms and the social media posters that they tend to use and recycle and assert the same jargon, the same slogans over time and time again, like. Free all the political prisoners, free Umar Khalid, free Sergei Imam, free Khalid Saki, and so on. So these hashtags, uh, uh, these hashtags, uh, like they tend to invite a lot of uh, charm to it and the political charm to it, and also try to garner the maximum resistance that could be built during the uh, lockdown. And uh, less to say, like uh, posters have been a forefront forefront during the lockdowns because there was that is that was the only only one way to convey and sustain the resistance as we know the Shaheen Bagh also got uh, it got evacuated after forceful evacuation happened and the people got killed people got injured and uh, so posters have been uh, forefront in this and social media and Last but not not the least, uh, like to say the onslaught on the government. And now there are news as as uh, just a month back before uh, uh, it happened to be that Uttarakhand, a, a state in India, where a, a chief minister um, uh, chief minister enacts a law which says that uh, uh, you sh you wouldn't be issued a passport if uh, if you are coming with any anti if your if your social media accounts handles 
have any anti uh, government policies posters post anything so the surveillance is so hard and the uh, frustration is so hard that student communities uh, still have that uh, they still don't flinch they have that unflagging effort to stand and show a mirror to the government to actually uh, continuous to stay continuous to stay in a continuity and like share the same emotion uh, country wide thank you i hope i did answer your yeah question. you raised something which i hadn't thought about which is of course social media is being watched very carefully in india meaning that your participation as a part of the audience for political art if you like if you share you're identifiable in a way that you weren't just simply part of the campus community or part of the, the Shaheen Bagh prote protest. So that's really interesting. And it, presumably it's difficult for your work because so many people have moved on to Signal precisely so that that can't happen. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, the organization members primarily yeah. have already, uh, they, have, they have been using the uh, Signal app like since way back, like four yeah. months ago or five months ago. It was the yeah. recent that WhatsApp, uh, like the privacy issues that first all created by WhatsApp. Yes, thank you. Well, some really excellent points being raised, and I hope we can come back to them in some general discussion at the end of our time today. But I'm conscientious we want to leave some time for our final two presenters as well before we have that general discussion. But thank you so much for um, an excellent two part presentation and fascinating to have the opportunity to find out more about the work you're doing. Um, so thank you all again. And uh, my great pleasure now to introduce our third presenter for this afternoon, uh, Proiti Seel Acharya, uh, sorry, Acharya, who is currently enrolled in the final semester of the Erasmus Mundus uh, Joint Master's Degree in Media Arts and Cultures, which is offered collaboratively by Danube University, Krem, Alberg University, University of Lodz, and the La Salle College of the Arts. Now, Proiti is primarily interested in South Asian media art and digital and she's also interested in the work of artists and institutions that attempt to employ decolonial methods within the scope of their practices, proposing alternate technologies and ways of dissemination. She's currently building a publicly accessible online archive of South Asian art, which she hopes will reflect these values and motivations. And the subject of her talk today, Media Art South Asia, creating a decolonial media art archive, both reflects and reports on this work. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, thank you. Um, just give me a moment to share my screen, please. Sure. Um, can you see my screen? It's appearing now and it um, looks excellent. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so, okay, um, uh, hi everyone. Um, I am really, I want to express my gratitude for having this opportunity to share this um, presentation he, uh, here with you today. And I also want to congratulate the two presenters, the three presenters before me. It was fascinating to hear about the work that you've done. Um, so I am here to talk about a project that um, is called Media Art South Asia. And this is a very new project. It's an it's we are still working on it. Um, so, uh, as was mentioned in my introduction, I'm currently pursuing an Erasmus Mundus Joint Masters in Media and Sculptures, uh, which is taking place in Europe. And uh, this is a project that I started uh, while in my first uh, year uh, of the master's. And before I uh, go into detail about what the project is, I just want to briefly um, present a definition of media art because there are so many definitions out there and it can be quite confusing. So as you can see here, new media art or media art includes artworks designed and produced by means of new media technologies comprising virtual art, computer graphics, computer animation, digital art, interactive art, sound art, internet art, games, robotics, 3D printing, and cyborg art, but it's always evolving. And as uh, people are coming up with new technologies, artists are using them to innovate and create new work. And since this is about media art in South Asia, I want to provide a very brief history of um, media art in uh, this region. So um, 
Uh, I have here referred to the work of critic and curator Nancy Adjania, who writes that there could be no global history of media art and the history of new media art in any local context is dependent on the technological advances and politics of communication as they prevail in that region. Um, so here she mentions video art in particular because that was one of the earliest forms of media art. Um, it In India, there is no regional tradition of video art in the 60s and 70s as is, is as is the case in industrially advanced nations, where because of the needs of the military, the espionage and surveillance concerns of the World War military industrial complex, these technologies became available much earlier. Uh, in India, these uh, technologies came, the arrival and dissemination of video happened in the 1980s and ensured that video art could flower in this country. She mentions India in, 19, in the 1990s and she identifies Krishnan Khanna, a painter who expanded the scope of his work by using projectors and photography and Akbar Padamsi, whose uh, work with animation, these were the pioneers of media art in this region. And although their work was not recognized as media art when they uh, were actually engaged in it, they did pave the way for more and more artists to experiment with video, internet, projection and other digital tools and mediums. Um, so currently, of course, we have uh, in Indian and South Asian artists working with advanced technologies, including AR, VR, robotics, and so on. So, so while artists have always worked with media art uh, for several decades now, the infrastructure hasn't been at par. So there haven't been organizations or um, uh, other kinds of uh, bodies, funding sources who have specifically uh, tried to work to support media artists. And this is where Media Art South Asia comes in. So how did this project begin? So when I joined the Erasmus Mundus Masters in Media Arts, I didn't really know much about Media Art in India. I mean, of course, I didn't know about South Asia, but I didn't even know about Media Art in India. And I sort of assumed that this was a Western um, practice, a Western field. And the curriculum that I found um, was also reflective of this. And I found that most of, although we did have professors coming in from uh, many different countries, including say Russia, even from Latin America and so on, the idea that we got from the curriculum was that media art does not happen in South Asia. It, it's mainly uh, taking place, uh, innovations and experiments are taking place in the West. And so I tried to look for uh, media artworks in India. And I found that I could not find any one source of information. I could find information in bits and pieces, maybe um, from other arts organizations who were involved in many different kinds of art. And maybe they did a little media art project on the side and things like that. So I decided that I would start a blog to accumulate all this information to put all this information in one place and then eventually this blog grew into a website and currently uh, it is a website which is dedicated to the dissemination of media art created in the Indian subcontinent and I am joined by another Indian classmate of mine so the two of us were in this European program and thinking like what about our own you know what about where we come from what about media art from there we want to know more so we tried to accumulate all that information and we made a website and our goal is to document and promote media artists, media art organizations, festivals, galleries, grants, awards, exhibitions, residencies, labs, and uh, not just for South Asian audiences, but for stakeholders working at the crossroads of art, science, and technology all over the globe. And what we want to do is make media art visible and to establish its uniqueness and also to connect it with the uh, global media art uh, fraternity. So this is what the website looks like. I would invite all of you to please go and check it out afterwards whenever you have time. It's mediaartsouthasia.org. And here we have a growing list of artists and we try to categorize them according to the kind of work that they're involved in and also the location. So, but this is still in its earliest stages and it's just the two of us and we have no funding and we have uh, really no one else. So it's just the two of us uh, trying to find more artists and more organizations, getting in touch with them and trying to create this kind of a database. Um, this is the list of, of festivals that we have. Uh, we are trying to make these lists as exhaustive as possible. But as I said, it's just the two of us. and. Um, so this is very much in its very, very earliest stages. Uh, I briefly want to touch upon uh, uh, what we plan to do, um, which is, first of all, as I said, we want to have a directory of South Asian media artists with information about their career highlights, their educational backgrounds, their theoretical uh, reflections, their uh, contacts. 
we want to have an archive of media artworks which i will come to eventually um uh, produced in south asia because uh, such an uh, all the archives that uh, currently exist of media the online archives are all very few south asian media artworks are present in those archives uh, we also want to have a directory of organizations and festivals we want to have online viewing rooms we want to conduct original research on the history of media art in south asia we want to create a professional social network for artists and technologists to connect them and for them to share, you know just for them uh, um it's not a not a regular kind of social network but just for artists and uh, media uh, technologists we also want to have virtual residencies for media artists pairing artists and technologists from different south asian regions so as i'm sure you all know um within south asia it can be quite a problem to uh, conduct collaborative activities due to because uh, going from one country to another and working there is can be quite tricky in some cases so the virtual um, medium gives us a lot of opportunity in that regard and we also want to conduct offline activities um like a, a symposium a media arts festival media art organizations and workshops right now we have conducted one festival which took place in collaboration with the french cultural network um and was supported by the french institute in paris where we had a number of south asian artists and artists from france who were uh, submitted artworks for a virtual festival and this festival will take place this year uh, in a hybrid format with both online and offline elements we are also currently working with another collective called the disappearing dialogues collective based here in kolkata and creating a tapestry an archive of of uh, global creative initiatives uh, focusing on water so now i want to focus on the archive uh, of media art that we want to create um that is by far the most challenging um aspect of all of these ideas that we have for this project so i want to briefly refer to the work of cosetta g saba from her book preserving exhibiting media art where she discusses the challenges and perspectives related to this and the problem of archiving media art um is that uh, is something that she discusses in this chapter and in order to keep media artworks accessible uh to contemporary and future users their inclusion in digital archives is of course extremely desirable digital archives can support the fundamental function of the cultural conservation of these works understood as a process that not only documents and preserves the technological and material dimensions of these complex works but also the cultural context in which they emerged and were seen and media artworks can often take the form of complex installations combining audiovisual components with sculptures objects and photographic components amongst others now how is it possible to archive such works so creating a digital archive of media artworks potentially entails a reduction of the works complexity and it is necessary to of course examine this complexity to understand how such archiving can take place and how these problems can be resolved now from the viewpoint of information technology digital archiving is the development of a digital library an expression that corresponds to an intrinsically multidisciplinary complex notion which defines a system of constitution order management and long term specialized functionality targeted at at user communities and media artworks belong to a project or a chain of projects and tend to be serial and variable instead of unique and stable from this follows that media art proves to be archivable only from a documentary standpoint given its multi multidimensionality and material conceptual and progressive complexity um so these are some of the biggest challenges that one would face uh, while trying to document media artworks and all the existing artworks uh media archives uh, struggle with this because they ultimately they end up documenting uh details information about the work but are not able to fully capture the various elements that make up a media artwork so the in many ways the digital archiving of complex media artworks entails consecutive translations and progressive dispersions of data um but not only that it involves a complex integrated system of documentation semantic indexation preservation restoration and cultural dissemination practices as well as a check of applications and information technology which are subjected to programmed obsolescence so the technology itself requires a constant monitoring because you know everything might return to plastic and silicon once again so the archive therefore is a social place before being a physical space it is a historically determined institutional space responsible for the selection and the construction conservation of documents 
Your archive is a collective memory complete with an institutionalized method for the recording of testimonies designed for the construction of the documents to archive. And uh, of course, what will be archived and what will not be archived, that really uh, take, is taking up a lot of, is also one of the bigger biggest challenges that we are currently facing. And uh, here I will briefly refer to the considerations uh, to uh, to uh, an article by J.J. Khadar and Michelle Caswell called To Go Beyond Towards the Decolonial Archival Praxis, um, where they talk about a research and practice approach that goes to the root cause of social, cultural, economic and political phenomena that reflects on and is transparent about the assumptions and positionalities of those producing and disseminating knowledge and that is committed to dismantling structures and systems of oppression and domination. It is change oriented and future minded insofar as it helps us imagine both a different way of archiving and a different world to be archived. Now, this is the background. This is I mean, this is the foundation that we are trying to have while creating this archive. Now, I will go into detail about the kinds of considerations that we are uh, go reflecting on while creating the South Asian Media Art Archive. And like I said, this is very much in the earliest stages. And one of the reasons I was keen on joining this workshop is to just sort of ga gain more inspiration about this because this is proving to be a real challenge. And I welcome any suggestions uh, from anyone who's listening. So some of the considerations that we have been able to think of are number one, first of all, the privilege of creating media art. Like, as you know, in South Asia, there is huge um, inequality in terms of access to resources. And so the biggest question uh, is who gets to create media art? And this is a field that relies heavily on uh, technology and technology, of course, who gets access to technology is determined by the economic and the social and political resources that they have. So automatically does media art become something that is elitist and hence uh, erases or marginalizes large sections of South Asian populations. So how does an archive address this inequality, how, what are the ways in which it can highlight this issue while at the same time doing justice to the works that it is trying to uh, preserve for the future. So this is one consideration uh, we have while creating uh, an archive that is unique for South Asian media art. Um, second, of course, the language issue in the subcontinent. There are, of course, thousands of languages that are being spoken and used. So if the archive is in the, say, English language, which it is now, of course, the website is in English. Um, how do you address that problem and what languages, uh, even if it becomes multilingual, uh, which languages to choose and uh, what are the motivations behind choosing those languages and on what grounds would those languages be chosen? What script will be used? This is another problem to grapple with. Uh, the question of Internet access, uh, even if um, the archive is available freely, publicly accessible online. That still eliminates uh, many people from the possibility of accessing that archive because not everyone has an internet connection. Um, and what are the ways in which this online archive might be brought to those who may not have an internet connection? Is that something that the archive is at all responsible for? Um, or is that something that is up to whoever is using it? Uh, there is also uh, the the how this work is framed, how the archive is framed. Um, and this is something that has come up in a lot of our conversations with curators working in this field who have repeatedly mentioned that it's very important to provide a historical social perspective of media art in South Asia for the archive to truly do justice to the practices in this uh, region. And also another point that we have grappled with is that much of the technology used to create media art, both in South Asia and globally, um, is much of, as well as the infrastructure that would power an online archive, relies on the products of mining, an activity that disproportionately harms labor populations and environmental conditions in the global south. How can an archive of South Asian media art be mindful uh, of this context? And finally, representation. How can the archive ensure that certain voices and perspectives are not privileged over others? How to ensure that the inherent biases of the archive creators do not impact the layout of the archive? And finally, just briefly, I'm, I'm almost done. Um, so these are possible sources of information that we are looking at for creating this new kind of archive um, is that, of course, indigenous record keeping practices from across the globe, oral transmission uh, systems uh, and layouts from tribal and other community based uh, uh, systems that could help us determine new ways of uh, documentation and dissemination and also design systems or intricate patterns uh, that could provide some kind of inspiration for how this information percolates 
to the archive. And finally, our current activities are planning the second edition of the festival that I mentioned that we did last year with the French Cultural Network. We're interviewing artists and curators to uh, understand what they need from an organization like this and how they would approach the archive because their works are the ones that will be featured ultimately. We are also researching existing archives that try to uh, reimagine the archive in new ways. And we are, of course, adding more information to the database related to artists, uh, organizations, and so on. That's it. Thank you for listening. And I would uh, welcome everyone to take a look at the main website and the festival website if they have time. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, and some very important questions being made, uh, specifically relate to your work, but also are much more general relevance um, to think about. A few questions have come up in the chat during your presentation. Um, yeah. The first of which um, comes from Sanya Vrata. Um, may I invite you to ask your question about uh, the space that the art occupies and um, what potential it might have to come to the forefront in the future. Yes, so this is something that I, I briefly uh, touched upon uh, when I was speaking is that uh, the media, uh, I, because of its heavy reliance on technology, it automatically eliminates a lot of people, not only from being able to create it, but also to access it, even if it is uh, archived in a publicly accessible platform. So when this is something that uh, I, I, I don't really see a solution for at this moment, because um, uh, what we will try to do once the organization or the archive is, you know, it takes shape as we want it to, we will try to, at least even if we cannot provide resources, you know, for, um, depends on the kind of funding we get really, but uh, we, when it comes to dissemination, we want to make it as accessible as possible in as many different languages as possible and also to take the archive, you know, outside these urban elite spaces and galleries, but to take them to, you know, to maybe to uh, beyond these uh, urban spaces, beyond these religious spaces or the white cube uh, and try to hopefully reach more people who may not have access otherwise. That's something I can think of, but this is a larger question about inequality in South Asian societies that and in, in, in inequal access to technology that I think, I mean, <laughs> I cannot answer that. I can't think of a solution that big. It's well, I hope that um, answers the question that you had, Semi Brata. I think it's a really interesting point, but also it's one that speaks to the question that Debs has as well, I know. Um, but maybe I can invite Debs to ask her question. Hi, thank you. That was a really fascinating and rich talk. Um, in terms of, uh, sorry, I, one sort of comment which is annoying, but I was thinking while you were talking that in response to the last question about bringing social media installations or social media installations out of exhibition spaces about a project um, actually in, in Pakistan in Lahore um, which is aiming to create through the Lahore biennial um, installations within urban spaces with the very explicit aim of, of bringing this kind of art into sort of um, direct engagement with, with local audiences and communities um, but the other question I had is whether you thought about the role that smartphones, which are um, a proliferating technology in India, uh, what role they might have in bringing um, media art uh, to a wider audience and a, and a less elite audience. Yeah, thank you for your question. And I think that um, this this is one reason why we want to create this archive in the first place, because um, as we said, uh, as I said, like there is no one place where uh, all of, you know, South Asian media can be accessed. Uh, even on the web, you know, like there's no one source. So if, if we manage to create this archive where we, you have not only information about uh, what activities are going on even in offline spaces, but you also get to, you know, view artwork online and so on. So that makes it a lot more accessible comparatively. So uh, on mobile devices and of course, like the website that we have right now, it's compatible with mobile because I mean, everyone knows that that's the future and more and more people are accessing the Internet only through mobile. And of course, with, in case of South Asia, that is a huge aspect. Um, so uh, I definitely think that mobile will help to uh, bridge a lot of that gap but whether it is the you know the the ultimate solution i mean that remains to be seen but definitely for sure um, if we are able to uh, create this online archive that would uh, people would be able to access from their mobile phones that would definitely bring this art closer to a lot of new uh, communities and populations 
Well, very good. And, uh, a question from Ben, actually. And Ben, I'm sorry, I spoke over your question earlier. Um, hadn't had the reflexivity to think I could invite you to ask your own question. So um, may I invite you to ask the question now? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so yeah, this got me thinking about how you make sure that m media art in South Asia is seen positively, because all this massive craze, especially in the Western world at the moment, for crypto art, which is basically a way of using Bitcoin technologies and blockchains to sell digital art at stupid prices for seemingly absolutely no reason whatsoever. And it's become almost seen as kind of elitist, horrifically environmentally unfriendly fad. Now, obviously, most media art is not that. But especially, as you said, in a in a context in South Asia where, where most people this would be seen as elitist, is there a way you can present your archive as a as a democratizing process, perhaps? So, although not everyone can create this art, we the the sharing is the important part. Yeah. Um, I mean, how, how have you thought of funding it? But you said you haven't got any funding at the moment. No. No, unfortunately not. But I think this is exactly um, what I was trying to like, what we hope to ensure is that people don't think of South Asian media art as something elitist and something inaccessible. And the challenge is to make it accessible. And um, now with when it comes to crypto art and NFTs and things like that, I mean, I, I don't think that th that has reached, you know, mass populations in India yet. Uh, so um, I, I don't think that South Asian media art would be lumped with those practices. But at the same time, a lot of South Asian media art practices do um, are born in, you know, urban English speaking, upper class, upper caste circles. So the challenge is how to make that art something that, you know, general populations who do not belong to those circles, uh, how, how to, uh, the, that is one challenge, how to make that art accessible and, you know, relatable for them, but also how to break South Asian media art out of those circles. I think that would that is a, even a bigger challenge and that is something that we hope to do. And I mean, right at this moment, because we have no funding and we have no, um, you know, so we have very little, we have no manpower. So at this moment, there's not much we can do. But what we try to do is do, you know, take small steps. For example, when we are doing the second version of our festival, the second edition of our festival. So we have... Um, asked our collaborators to make sure that they um, you know if they're if they are collaborating or commissioning uh, with other organizations or artists that they take um, they um, involve underrepresented groups uh, and that they uh, you know commission artists who uh, you know maybe women artists or uh, women or artists who do not get the opportunities that they deserve because of their social economic or political position so we are trying to do those kinds of things at this moment because we have nothing and we have no power but uh, uh, we hope that eventually we can carry forward with this and bridge this gap uh, in as many ways as possible. No, good luck. Keep going. Thank you. Well, thank you again very much for that. We're kind of just about to time. Um, just scanning around to see if anyone had a further point or question, but hopefully we have a little bit of time at the end of our session today for any further comments or comparisons that you might like to draw. Um, comparisons you might like to make, I should add comments, you might like to make. <laughs> getting myself twisted around. Um, but thank you again very much for a fascinating presentation, and one that thank raised some um, uh, kind of weighty questions for us to ponder. Our final presenter for today, a uh, great pleasure to introduce, is Dr. Katie Roscoe, uh, who is Lever Hume Early Career Fellow at the University of Liverpool. Dr. Roscoe is a historical criminologist, um, and she's researching crime and punishment in the British Empire. And her work um, in that context really brings into one frame the punishment of indigenous European and other migrants in colonial Australia, Bermuda and Gibraltar. Um, so spanning the different um, global contexts. Her Lieberhume project um, involves mapping the life geographies of convicts deployed to colonies to build the dockyards that enabled the steam revolution. And during her ESRC postdoctoral fellowship, she created a digital database of more than 2,000 convicts and a website um, 
cockatoos convicts, which will be the subject of her presentation today in many ways, diversifying or decolonizing digital crime archives. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. No, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I haven't been able to share my screen, so I believe Rihanna's kindly going to do that for me. Um, I have a Mac, so I don't know if that's the issue or if it's just me. Um, that's all right. I think the screen might be going live now. Yes, perfect. Um, thank you, Rihanna. And thank you also for organising it, as well as Catherine. Um, I've really enjoyed it so far and it's you know been great to um, be part of these conversations. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll get started. Um, so as Christopher mentioned, uh, this work comes from an ESRC project that I did. Uh, so I created a database of more than two and a half thousand prisoners who were incarcerated on Cockatoo Island, which is uh, kind of Sydney's Alcatraz. It's a prison island in the middle of Sydney Harbour, and it was operational during uh, their colonial period in the mid 19th century. So in this presentation, I'll be reflecting on sort of the process of developing an online resource like this as a sort of solo uh, practitioner over the course of uh, one year and sort of discussing the challenges that I came across and the opportunities that I saw for diversifying or even better decolonizing this resource and where that might lead to um, in larger projects and in the digital crime history sphere in general because this is the main place in which people who are interested in um, crime narratives, family historians, local historians, it is online that they tend to encounter um, many of the archives. So uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, this is uh, Wariyama, which is the largest island in Sydney Harbour, um, now known as Cockatoo Island. It was named Cockatoo originally because it was covered in thick red gum trees, which attracted the birds. Uh, so that's sort of the top picture is showing a little bit of what it might have looked like um, just, just after invasion and then how it ended up looking. Um, so what we can see is, you know, it's rapidly deforested, it's transformed, and that's because it begins, starts to be used as a um, penal station from 1839. So effectively, the idea is uh, that convicts who had been transported to Australia as settlers, uh, if they misconducted themselves or in some other way um, were considered dangerous, um, they would be sent to this island to do um, to this prison to do hard labour as a secondary punishment. And they were there on the island for 30 years. And the main task that they ended up completing was a um, large dockyard for repairing um, British vessels and men of war because they didn't have um, somewhere in the southern hemisphere well they wanted an extra place to repair them after the long journey to Australia and it was a very you know difficult grueling task the pickaxes they actually um, quarried the dock into the sandstone base of the island which was extremely grueling time consuming and hard work for the convicts. The other strange feature that's worth mentioning um, is that they actually ran as both it, the island was both a dockyard and a prison from 1840, 1857 sorry, to 69. So the prisoners manned the dockyard. They extended the dimensions of the dock because steam power had come in. They manned the workshops. Um, so it was both, which was a very <laughs> um, difficult and uncomfortable thing to run both at the same time. Um, today, it is a regular tourist destination accessible by ferry. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of this convict legacy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is going to be, you have to click through a few of these. You have to click through because it's a picture of the records. OK, so um, if you just keep clicking, Rihanna, um, that would be great. So these are this is sort of the records I was working with when I was trying to make a database of the prisoners because they had a particular reputation and I wanted to see if the um, data bore that out. So we have the name, the ship and year of arrival, uh, some fit, um, going down one level, we have details of their colonial conviction, the first one and halfway down the page if they returned to Cockatoo Island, a second one, um, the offence they committed, the, their occupation, their age, their religion, their place of birth, some physical details, complexion, eye and hair colour, height and weight and any other features like scars or tattoos. And then we see in the sort of more descriptive section uh, a list of what they did in sort of during imprisonments. That will mostly be if they had a job in the prison, if they misconducted themselves, if they sent a petition, um, when they arrived and when they left and under what circumstances. And if you could go on to the next slide, you'll see how I took that and turned it into a database. It's worth mentioning that the first, um, the actual picture, I, sorry, the page that I chose of the prison register was um, of a 
prisoner for which whom there was a lot of information, James Sullivan, uh, an Irish convict from Cork. And we can that would be the pe the most sort of complete records. But and um, if we can go to the next slide, um, that wasn't the case for everyone. And we do have a bit of a mix on the island. And that's something that's really been lost in this sort of focus on its convict heritage, which um, was actually relatively short lived because convict transportation ended in the 1840s. So while the vast majority of convicts transported to the Australian colonies under that sentence, transportation were white British and Irish men. Um, so for context, only around a thousand out of 160,000 people transported to the Australian colonies between 1788 and um, 1868 were black. The rest, and it's hard to judge others because they were in very small numbers coming from different colonies. Um, there was a far richer mix when we start to look into the prison running as it did in the 1850s and 60s when it started to operate more as just a kind of local jail for people um, convicted within the colony. So that would include um, descendants of convicts, so people of European descent, assisted migrants from Britain and Ireland, but it also included indigenous prisoners who were resisting the invasion of their lands at the frontier. It included people arriving for the gold rush from the from 1848 when gold was discovered in New South Wales. And many of them were Chinese indentured workers. And it's worth remembering that Sydney was a port city. And once um, the East India Company monopoly was lifted, um, vessels could come from all different parts of the world. So we start to see American whalers, all kinds of vessels. And a lot of those seamen are people of colour um, from the US, Alaska's from India, from the Pacific Islands and so on. Uh, next slide, please, Rihanna. So I, of course, I was a historian of empire before I was a historian of punishment, was very interested in these cases, but they sort of got lost in the data set, right? They really are small in terms of numbers. So, um, for example, there are 14 Chinese prisoners in that database. The database doesn't cover the entire period Cockatoo Island was open. So I managed to identify 37 by looking at some different record sets, which is also something worth discussing the difficulties of ensuring you've got a complete data set when you're just one person and you're transcribing by hand. Um, but you can see some numbers here. So 14 Chinese people, five Aboriginal people, and then, you know, nine from the African-Americans, uh, four from the West Indies, as it was known, and then a handful of people from other places. Um, and I decided to sort of showcase them because I found them very interesting and found it a useful way to think through how their experiences may have been different within the colonial context, um, how they might have experienced laws, punishment differently on the basis of their, their culture, their nationality and their race. But what I found is when I looked at the actual stats is nearly everyone was going to my website, clicking on the Excel spreadsheet, downloading it and ignoring all the rest where I'd tried to contextualise the archives, where I'd shown some more diverse convict lives. And that's totally understandable in the sense that my that my it was feeling was that it's mostly family historians who are accessing the resource they're searching you know control f find their ancestor in in the database um and then moving on and i'd only ever hear from people if they had been using it in that way and they'd not found um the ancestor that they were looking for i did a few public lectures that tried to emphasize this and that um revealed some really fruitful connections, for example, to do with a particular convict called um, John Perry, whose portrait hangs in the V&A and who's a, a black Irish uh, boxer. But overall, I felt a bit frustrated because I thought, well, this may be slightly diversifying the story, but it's not fundamentally decolonizing it. It's not fundamentally changing the shape of the archive. By digitizing it, I haven't actually fixed any of the problems and the politics of its production. Um, next slide, please, Rihanna. Um, so I'm going to go through this really quickly, but I sort of got to this part of the presentation. I thought I can't mention all these lives and then not tell you anything about them. But if you are interested, you can look at the website. Um, so these are just three. So this is John Perry, who I mentioned, who is a black Dubliner. Um, he grew up among the military. His father was formerly enslaved and was um, in the regiment as a drummer. John Perry therefore grew up with fighting and he ended up becoming, he, he was a huge man as well. He became a very imposing uh, pugilist, a boxer. He was transported for using a forged note to buy a suit for his wedding um, and was transported aboard the Eden to New South Wales. The following year, 1849, he becomes the champion of New South Wales. He becomes very famous. He wins a boxing match there. Um, and you even get the um, other boxers saying, you know, uh, I'll fight anyone who's not black, i.e. basically only Perry, because he was so um, uh, great at boxing and they didn't want to lose to him. 
Uh, he ends up being prosecuted again in Australia and actually on the way back saves the life of the chief justice who convicted him. Their ship nearly capsizes. He manages to keep it, um, keep it from doing so because he's an experienced sailor. Um, but the chief justice refuses to the, the order of the governor to reduce his sentence because he thinks, well, he was only trying to save his own skin anyway, and he's not a respectable gentleman. Anyway, he ends up serving three stints on Cockatoo Island and he continues to box throughout that time and teaches the superintendent's son how to box um, and gets sort of privileged treatment for that. So the prison becomes a prize fighting ring. Um, another sort of more typical case perhaps would be Neville's Billy. I think the name speaks already to some of the issues here that we have with trying to identify indigenous life stories through a colonial record set. He's only identified as um, the master, the sort of Billy belonging to his master Neville. And he's sentenced to death for spearing a hut keeper at Oobalong in 1840, which is repeatedly described in the records as beyond the boundaries of location, meaning beyond an ordinary settlement and where the police are regularly active. But nonetheless, he's convicted. Um, and the Chief Justice notes um, that he's been tried by a tribunal to him, wholly foreign, in a language he doesn't understand, without the ability to call his fellow countrymen as witnesses, because they're not Christians, so they can't uh, swear on the Bible. Um, and he ends up being sentenced to death despite that, but it is commuted sort of in recognition of his um, indigeneity, I suppose, and he's commuted to three years. But unfortunately, like many of his uh, fellow indigenous prisoners on the island, which a number um, 21 in total, he, he dies very quickly. He succumbs to death just two months after arriving on the island in 1841. So it effectively ends up being a death sentence because the hard labour is very gruelling. And of course, um, he isn't um, resistant to some of the diseases that his fellow pr uh, prisoners have. And finally, um, and I should really move on, but I just think it's important to get a sense of the real people behind the data set like this. Um, Sinsoon and Hintik, again, very far removed from their real names, I'm sure, but that's how they're recorded in the colonial archive, uh, were convicted along with some other compatriots in 1854 for murder of an abusive employer, Richard Granger at Toulon. Um, and, that, and it's very clear that he hires only Chinese, pretty much only ind Chinese indentured workers uh, because they're easy to intimidate. He's drunken, he beats them, he threatens them with a gun and eventually they snap and they kill him. Um, and they bury the body, um, but they end up being discovered by the European um, employee who comes back and who admits in court that he actually doesn't know who is who because they all look the same to him. But nonetheless, they still insist on individual criminal responsibility. One of them um, informs upon the others whether, you know, rightfully, well, sort of whether that's true or not, it's hard to know if he's trying to avoid his own incarceration. And they end up um, being sentenced to 12 years. Uh, next slide, please. I hope you'll forgive my transgression, uh, sort of digression, sorry. So where does this fit into wider digital convict history? Well, I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, what makes um, this record set about Australian convicts so unique is that it is the largest collection of information, mass collection we have on a working class population prior to the census. It is extremely detailed. We saw the sort of biometric information before, and it's really useful for examining white working class populations. As a result, crime history has been at the forefront of some of our big data digital history projects, most famously in the UK, the Old Bailey Online, but in Australia as well, they've been able to do live course connecting Old Bailey records to Australian convict records uh, in Tasmania through founders and survivors, and more broadly across Australia in the digital panopticon. And we're talking millions of records um, and linked together through record linkage to see life courses. Yeah. And also payable genealogical sites have been really important in terms of digitising uh, more and more crime records. Um, Australia's convict records, for example, in the State Archives of New South Wales, which is where the, date, the stuff that I've uh, dig um, put in the database came from, have also been given UNESCO World Heritage status because the fact these convict lives are minutely document documented. Sorry, there's a typo on the... Uh, PowerPoint there, but I think you know what I mean. But as Godfrey, who created the Digital Panopticon, has argued, Barry Godfrey, um, do these new liquid forms of research enable the recovery of the lives of the dispossessed and powerless equally? And I thought that word dispossessed was really important because I think of dispossession in context of the indigenous population who were dispossessed. So there's a little bit of a unspoken bias towards what kinds of lives we are recovering through this archive. Next slide, please. 
And there are clear archival silences when we're interested in um, prisoners of colour. And this comes from my background looking, as was mentioned in the introduction, also Indigenous prisoners, both on Cockatoo Island, but primarily at a larger prison for Indigenous people on Wajimup or Rotnest Island. And what I noticed is that when you look at these digital records, they're so decontextualised from that archive and the context of their production, the particular power relations, that you that for people looking at them, um, it might just the temptation is just to look at an individual who has a complete life, whether that's your ancestor or um, just someone who's kind of easy to find. Certain individuals are easier to find, both in terms of the breadth of the archive, but also in terms of the depth and the level of detail that is recorded about them. Because prisoners of colour often do not have a convict number, which is the key way that you trace them throughout the system. For um, the prisoners in uh, Rottnest Island that I mentioned, they try and assign them numbers, they're never consistent. The prisoners actually swap the prison tags with their numbers on it. So it's impossible, often impossible to trace them. It takes a lot more work um, and a lot more experience. Um, names are also change. They're, they're anglicised, but on top of that, they're written in a different way. Sometimes every time you see them or they're using nicknames um, and sort of insulting ones at that sometimes that are just um, make it very difficult to identify one or the other. So, for example, um, words, names like Sambo are very common for Indigenous prisoners. Um, you're less likely to have birth or death recorded or an accurate age because they're not from British institutions. Um, the ship of arrival that there is often not recorded, even though they would have had one if they were a sailor coming on board. Often it just lists the place that they're from rather than the ship that they're coming in from. Uh, whereas if it's a, com a convict from uh, transported from Britain and Ireland, it always lists that. That's the key way you identify them across these multiple data sets and create a life course. Um, even the way that we see physicality described, complexions are often kind of a stereotype. Uh, it's just a certain set of categories, whereas white complexions are described in great detail as ruddy, as um, freckled, rather than just um, black or copper, for example. Um, equally with scars, we won't see always an individualised listing. Some sort of just have usual scars on torso for an Indigenous person, for example, and often they don't bother with the height or weight data either. Uh, next slide, please. So I think this goes beyond just gaps in the archive, though, which I arguably digital archives exacerbate because there's so much focus on tracing an individual and record linkage. So it exacerbates the problem over time. I think it's also got to do with what people are interested in. There's a slightly more um, public history angle to this. And that's because, as Anne Kerthoys has argued, many non-Indigenous Australians have difficulty seeing themselves as the beneficiaries of colonisation because they see themselves as victims, not oppressors. And a perfect example of that is um, the fact that Fremantle Prison is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but across the road, Rotnest, uh, sorry, across the water, Rotnest, um, Wajimup isn't uh, because it's an Aboriginal prison. And so what I'd argue is that genealogy involves searching for yourself and criminal ancestors are very likely to have been success stories. Um, dis desistance uh, from crime is enabled through marriage, through having a job and all these kinds of things, even today. And so if you have an ancestor you're researching, they very likely pull themselves up by the bootstraps. And that's very much the narrative. But of course, when we look at patterns of offending today, that is nowhere near that as easy as that, with very different circumstances. So they may be biased towards ex-offenders. And that's particularly problematic when we consider the overrepresentation of Indigenous people in custody. In 2015, Indigenous people were 15, point, 15 and a half times more likely to be incarcerated than non-Indigenous people. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to finish up here. Um, so obviously I haven't solved all of these problems um, at all. I just see some very exciting projects already ongoing and on the horizon that I think can make a big difference to some of these things. So one of these strategies that's quite simple might be dual naming. If you say someone's transported to somewhere, say the country that it belongs to, so New South Wales, country of the Kamagal and Gadigal people, for example, and that would help us link histories of forced migration with dispossession of Indigenous people. And I think it's this movement from individual to systemic issues that really um, ch changes us from diversifying to decolonizing. Mapping is a really powerful way of communicating this sort of relationship from someone being a victim from state violence on the UK level and then once they get to a settler colony a different set of structures being at play. So Muru, Muru View for example uses a Google Maps API but overlays it with indigenous names which they've taken from historical documents and there's a 
a good wealth of, doc, of, of data about land use of convicts from their ticket of leave and their land, land grant documents. So there's definitely a way that we can link this with uh, records of indigenous dispossession and state violence. For example, Imogen Wegman's work or uh, the colonial frontier massacres resource. And finally, I think crowdsourcing and collaboration is really important. In family historians and local historians, we have a really powerful um, group, a very well-informed group, I'm finishing up, don't worry, a very well-informed group who can really help you with their skills, but you also need to collaborate with Indigenous communities who bring a different set of knowledge with them. And this is something that the prosecution project, another great project, is starting to pilot. Um, sorry, I'm a few minutes late. I'll finish up here and I welcome questions. Emma, thank you very much. Um, and I, I didn't mean for my appearance to be um, <laughs> ominous in any way. <laughs> but uh, no, thank you for a terrific presentation. Really fascinating work. And I can see some linkages, and I'm sure many of you in the audience can, with the other presentation. Rihanna has shot a hand up. Um, and because we are a little limited for time, I'll just turn over to Rihanna in the first instance. Thank you. Sorry, I thought I'd abuse it while I uh, um, was fiddling with the getting the sharing screen. I saw him on the slides. Um, it had the, the tale of two Fredericks, the homosexuality. I was yeah. just wondering if you could talk a little bit more around that because I'm a queer historian and as much as I hate to be like, talk to me about my interests. I thought that was quite interesting that that was something that was noted and I was wondering if there's a bit more around that. Yeah, um, in brief, I mean, I just found an archive. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of evidence of uh, queer relationships in the archive, but the problem it's all filtered through the Victorian kind of shock scandal things. There's a lot of, oh, there's rumours of homosexual acts, but we never, I didn't see it. We didn't speak about it. Let's use a metaphor about a bawdy song that rather than talk about it, you know, in a prison inquiry. So there is a lot of rumour swelling around. We definitely have cases of slang used for uh, certain men that are effeminized. Um, the two Fredericks is just a very rare case I came across that was literally, they were literally prosecuted because they were caught in the act, which is quite rare. So there's a quite a invasive medical a description of a medical examination. And the blog is me, really me trying to read what I can out of a very um, a sort of document that doesn't give them much power to try and read into what their relationship might have been, what we know about them and their age difference. And then a very short line where he says, um, this is Perty, I'm going to get lagged now, which was an interesting case of sort of a bit of slang being used. Um, and they were both called Frederick. So I postulated they, it might have been a love story, but it could also have just been a convenience. It could have been many different things and it's impossible to read it more fully than that from what I had in the archive. Thank you. I'll definitely have another look at that. <laughs> oh, terrific. Um, I also I have a few questions of my own, which I'm happy to come in with, but just to make sure that no one else is waiting on a question. I don't see any in the chat, but no one's raised a hand that I'm not perceiving, I don't think. Can't see any either. Well, well, in any case, I mean, I think one thing that I found really interesting thinking about your presentation in light of the others today um, was what you raised in relation to the nature of the kind of data that we have um, as being of a quantitative nature. And then also the difficulty introduced by the desire to format in ways that are appropriate for it to be used with different kinds of digital method or computationally driven methodologies, which require a kind of cleaning, mm. uh, as it were, a kind of sanitizing of the data, which prioritizes, and often in many cases, just those kinds of um, quantitative means of organization that are part of that larger epistemology, um, mm. the hegemonic epistemology, which this kind of reading is trying to resist. And mm. maybe it's oversimplification, but it seemed to me the kind of prosopographical approach, the life story mm. approach, um, which you presented, I think, I thought was a kind of a glorious inclusion, and maybe you presented it as a digression. But I wonder if that kind of digression away from the quantitative method, uh, even if you know it's facilitated by a kind of digital reading, but it's also initiated by a pause where um, the digital breaks down in a way and you can build from these fragments, where they are in many cases, as you've indicated, fragments, to read against the grain of what the data can tell you, what the data wants to tell you in the first instance at any rate. So it's a bit of a windering question, but um, mm. that's what no. we think. No, I definitely identify with that. It was often those prisoners that had a different backdrop that both jumped out to me in the database, but then took so much longer to to find, you know, to sort of trawl the whatever the newspapers for or really 
it was a much more ponderous process and I think more rewarding for that but then it's a question of you know um just because I I want to find out more how can I present this in a way that adds to the database and and changes the story a little bit but while recognizing that it's not you know I think you're right it's sometimes easy to think more lines in the data set is valuable but when I give a presentation that is all just the quantitative data the headlines the question I often get is but what about the live so I think people do want both and it's just finding a way to represent that the most effectively I think um which I'm working on you know thinking through I see a question in there Oh, um, has a question come up? So I think there might be a problem with my team site where I'm not seeing things as they appear. I think it's Ben. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, I could have put my hand up. Ben, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Katie. That was really interesting. And I think quite a few of the themes around, you know, almost data scarcity in some cases crop up mm -hmm. all the time. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a question or answer or what, but I'm just thinking of sometimes having the gaps in the data actually more useful. Mm. It gives you something to, from a historical perspective, to interpret with. Because I've found that if you sometimes look at an archaeological database and it has loads of information about everything, you think, well, what, what am I here for? You know, <laughs> I've done it already. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. I think at the same time, though, my feeling from the way digital crime history is at the moment, because it is these big data projects building on big data projects, and that leads to other biases that I didn't mention, which they've acknowledged themselves, like London-centric bias, because you've got this great data set, so everybody wants to build on it. And I do sometimes think that those gaps, particularly in big funding applications, kind of get lost. So on the one hand, I'm so lucky, because especially in the pandemic and not being based in Australia, you know, there is a lot that I can find online, and I value that. But as you say, then you don't always know what what you're not seeing because of just using the search term. And it's not until I guess you're confronted with that gap that you really have to confront more fully what isn't represented or why that might be harder to find. And it really was only when I kind of got to that point that I but I just thought, you know, if you were if you didn't have those gaps, yeah, I guess you would just kind of maybe they wouldn't jump out and it would all be the same and the gaps show that this experience and the understanding from the colonial archives point is different it tells you something in and of itself it's just how to communicate that on a web platform that's still usable for why people want to use it which might just be to find their ancestor which is perfectly legitimate yeah that's a good point <laughs> yeah because that just one of the thoughts of why mm. genealogy is so popular because it is you're looking at the history of one person and so it may be just being able to look at a record for one person and make a story out of it is the way forward, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, so I don't know where I'm going with that, but <laughs> thanks very much. No, thank you for the question. Well, it seems to be a theme that's come up in a number of the presentations today and concerns raised in other um, presentations last week. It seems to be that you know, the difficulty of reconciling um, those sort of top-down approaches that are interested in much larger patterns and if not entirely comprehensive, at least um, a very extensive uh, pulling together of information from multiple sources and linking uh, with that different approach which interrupts the totalizing by focusing in on just a specific entry, a specific person or a specific group. Um, so I think really interesting and inspiring work. Um, I, I'm conscious that we've been running for just about two hours, um, but I'm also conscious that my team um, chat seems to have frozen. So if there's someone hovering with the question who hasn't had a chance to answer it yet, um, please do speak up because I can't see you. I can't see anyone in the chat that's asked a question. Uh, but as we're at four o'clock now, um, happy to throw things open just very briefly if anyone has a final comment or observation before we draw into a bit of a conclusion. And if not, that's all right, too, because the conversation doesn't end here. We're not sort of closing the book so much as putting down a marker because this conference will resume this workshop, I should say, will resume next week on Wednesday, uh, where we'll have a pair of other panels. Um, I don't know if Debs or Rihanna want to say anything about that before we conclude. Oh, gosh, um, only do please book your um 
uh, book your presence and get hold of the link through the Eventbrite. Um, I'm very happy to circulate the programme again to anyone who's interested. Uh, maybe Catherine or Rihanna could stick it in the chat. Thank you there. Catherine's put it in the um, chat, so do have a look. And I hope to see as many of you as can make it next Wednesday. It's Wednesday, not Friday next week. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, thank you all. And um, thank you for, for such terrific presentations this afternoon. Really nice way of bringing the week to a close. Um, I wish we could give you a round of applause properly, but I suppose a digital applause will have to suffice for now.